Hi everyone, welcome so much for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon where we have the audience choice winners from the New York Lift Off Film Festival waiting to share with us their films. So we'll be playing the films muted in the background as we talk about everything to do with their films, whether that's um, the director's commentary or finding just out a little bit more about each project. Claire, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just, just that this has been an amazing experience. We've loved doing these. Uh, really excited for you to join in in the live chat um, where we'll be passing on all the comments. So I, I know I think that's everything. Yeah, I've got the chat up here. It's just us talking in there at the moment. So do fire away <laughs> um, questions that you may have for our filmmakers. Amazing. Okay. Well, I think we should introduce then our five filmmakers from four different projects here. Um, let's say hello to everybody. Hi. Hello everyone! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Foster, you're going to be kicking us off today with your film, so can you uh, start us with introducing yourself? Uh, I am Foster Solomon. And I am the writer, director, and uh, one of the lead actors in Hawks Ridge. Amazing. Great. Um, then we're going to be moving on to Drummies. Um, from which we've got two lovely filmmakers here with us today yes, from the project. Um, can you both introduce yourselves? You want to go first, Taryn? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Taryn Kalish. I directed and produced Drummies with my partner, Lillianne. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm Lillianne Laborde Dozian. And uh, as Taryn said, we co produced and co directed uh, Drummies, and we're kind of like a. Uh, a duo that does it all so yeah amazing yeah i can't wait to delve further into this film i think the topic is great and just highlighting what you're talking about i don't want to go into more details at this moment in yeah. time but i was a massive fan as it was screening during the festival um aaron over to you yeah i'm arhan and i'm from mumbai india from bollywood where they call it it's an indian film industry which is well known as Bollywood. I am the actor, writer, and director for the film Mumbai. Yeah. Wonderful. Which it already has been looks like you have. Audience. It looks Sorry? like you already have a few fans in the chat room here saying they've already started throwing right. questions out. So we will hang on to those until we are talking about your film. All right. Thank you so much for everyone to support me. Cool. Oh. And then Jane, over to you. Yeah, hi, I'm Jane Martin, and thank you for having me. I'm the director and producer of What is Love? Nice. East okay, Hampton. so as mentioned um, at the beginning there, we will be screening your films muted in the background. So without further ado, we will start with Hawks Ridge and Foster. So, um, with Foster Solomon, sorry. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what the film is about? If you have the synopsis to hand, that would be great. But just free flowing, telling us a little bit about your project. Oh, sorry, I think we've just lost you there, Foster. Um, sound wise. There we go. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I did what you said, and I muted while other people were talking, and then I forgot to unmute. Uh, <laughs> as I was saying, um, the log line I know so well, it still rolls off the tongue very conversationally. Uh, it is a drama about a black grieving ex-pastor uh, who uh, has to decide whether or not to save the life of the white man that killed his wife. Mm. Wow. And like just having that log line, it's so concise and to the point. So, but it yeah. took a long time to I'm sure boil when, that when whole we, when movie we... down to one sentence. <laughs> We sit, well, I think we may have talked about this when we interviewed you, but we sit and look at people's synopsises and, and the films that they come through. And if you have that one log line that is a sentence long, it holds so much weight, especially when you're talking to distributors and sale agents, because that is the mm -hmm. first thing that they ask to see. So was this your first feature project, Foster? Tell, it, tell people who are watching, we've spoken to you about this a bit before, but um, where did this come in your filmography? Uh, it it's the first one that is 100% mine from beginning to end, you know, coming up with the idea, writing it, raising the money myself, uh, 
finding, you know, actors and all of that type of stuff, uh, 100% like from start to finish mine. Uh, earlier in my life before kids, uh, I had a small production company in Atlanta, Georgia. We made short films and music videos for artists and everything. But um, yeah, and then uh, did like some work on a couple of features. But this was the first one in which I was like, uh, if anybody, me waiting for somebody else to give me a break, I just decided to stop waiting. I was at in my late 40s, and I was like, no more waiting. Let's just get it done myself. And so I did. Amazing. Great. So where did the idea come from then? So you'd worked on shorts, but what about the actual concept for this for Hawks Ridge? Well, the what a lot of people comment on is the location that we shot, the cabin that mm -hmm. it shot in and the mountains and everything. And all that's a real location at a place called Hawks Ridge uh, in Western Virginia. And that cabin that we shot in was built by my in-laws, uh, brick by brick. And, um, you know, we would always go up there to vacation, my wife and our kids and everything. And it was about 15-ish years ago. Uh, I had this idea while walking, you know, around the area of this is a great location for a film, what sort of small idea can I have with this? And all I had was uh, two guys stuck in this cabin. Um, one holds a secret and the other one wants the other one dead. And that was all I knew. Uh, and so that just germinated in my head for a while. And then sometime about three years ago, the idea of adding a religious aspect to it and sort of a ghost story, or is it the isolation that's making this guy see his late wife all the time? Uh, the whole like dream sequence, what's happening right now um, on the screen where, you know, he's, uh, and I know I think I'm a little bit behind what I'm watching on YouTube versus what is actually happening yeah. uh, right now, <laughs> but him waking up and everything. Um, and just, you know, all of that, just sort of came later and I've pretty much just like wrote it the first draft in just a couple of weeks and then tweaked it after that and then trying to get somebody to help me make it I just decided nope let's just make it myself amazing I, we love hearing people doing that because all too often it is well, we sort of sometimes brand it as like filmmaker fear mm. or things that just get things that get in the way that like are understandable but equally if you really do just want to go for it then do it then do it yeah <laughs> amazing so I want to I want to tell you I don't know number one I think like I said I'm a couple of seconds behind when I'm watching but I know uh, that my character Eli has walked out onto the porch and he's looking out at all of like the rain and everything yes uh, the main thing, I, I just have to tell this one story. Everybody <laughs> that was on this project knows the challenge of what happened when my script actually has them um, in this cabin and they're snowed in. They can't leave. It was meant to be like eight inches of snow. And that's what was 100% in the forecast. Oh. And when I drove up there before anybody else uh, to get the cabin set up, you know, it was shut down for the winter. I had to drive through all this snow. I had to get out a snow shovel and dig out the tire tracks so that the van could get to the cabin. And then the next day, when everybody started showing up, all the snow was gone. Oh, God. And so literally on the fly while we were there, uh, we, I rewrote all the lines about being snowed in to uh, being, because um, we knew that coming up was going to be a whole bunch of rain, like a torrential storm. Okay. And so I just simply wrote into, we were going to do all the exterior shots during that storm. And so I just changed all my lines to, uh, there's been a massive storm and uh, we are flooded in. Like there's, the road is too muddy for us to leave. And so I had to change all of that in, yeah, on the fly. <laughs> nature did not do what I wanted it to do. Good old contingency. See, I once had the opposite problem and it snowed on a final day of a shoot and ruined all our continuity. Um, I love the idea that you wanted it there <laughs> and it just wouldn't wouldn't show up. Oh, yeah. typical. Um, any other sort of problems that you had to overcome besides Mother Nature? No, for the most part, it was uh, a very easy shoot. We shot for 10 days up at the cabin, and then um, we came uh, back to Richmond, Virginia to shoot some uh, flashbacks. In other words, everything that's happening now. So there was that, that massive beard 
uh, that I spent six months growing yeah. <laughs> uh, that you see on the screen. And I mean, we had to make sure, we had to make sure literally everything set in the present day was shot, you know, uh, backed up onto two other hard drives. Yeah. Like it all had to be there because then I had to shave. So anything that you saw in this in which I'm clean shaven uh, that is a flashback to the past was actually shot at the end of the shoot after I had sure. shaved all my hair off. And so if we missed anything, there's there's no putting a... There was no pickups. No yeah, there was no a, pickup. A little reshoot, no. Yeah. Wow. So how did you find the experience of directing and acting mm -hmm. in the same piece? Well, I had um, my director of photography is a guy named uh, Douglas Bischoff. And he and I got together on this project. I just simply uh, put the word out in the Richmond film community. Uh, he and I ended up connecting. And we had very similar notions of what it is, that the story that I'd written. And basically what I'm trying to get at is uh, once we got up there, he knew the script really well, as well as I did. Uh, we had had extensive conversations about what I wanted things to look like. And so for me, once we got a shot set up, uh, I would look at what the shot looked like, and then uh, the other two actors that were up at the cabin with me were also friends of mine, colleagues in the Richmond theater community, uh, Keisha Wallace and Alexander Sapp. And we had had enough rehearsal to also just know what was going on in everything, so I would just simply look at the shot, trust that Doug was getting what I wanted. Maybe after the first take, I would want to look at how that take went, and then after that, I, I, I didn't, especially after the first couple of days when we really got into a groove, I really stopped looking at the monitor uh, all the time after each take and just trusted what he had. And then it was just me and my friends just acting together. They knew the script really well. Alexander had a solid idea of the character uh, that I wrote. I know I'm a little bit behind, but that's, yeah, that's that storm um, <laughs> that came in. There was a lot of rain and everything. As a matter, as a matter of fact, I want to pause for just a second. I know uh, we're having Eli walk through the fog right yeah. now um this was completely mother nature working with us in that this fog rolled in and what you don't know is is like just behind some of those trees are houses oh, uh, that, okay and it's supposed to be an isolated cabin yeah. so these 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 houses were there and the main thing to know is is that you know like when i find the car and i rappel down the cliff um which i'd never done before um <laughs> The moment we wrapped every single one of these scenes, it was like five minutes later, all the fog lifted. It was gone. <laughs> and so that was one of those times where Mother Nature actually, like, helped us because it's just, I mean, I just feel like Doug just captured some wonderful stuff in this, in this fog, yeah, foggy wood right. with... Well, you saved an absolute fortune of smoke machines. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, indeedy. So I, I don't know if I answered the earlier question, but I just saw that was on screen and I had to say that. No, no, that's sure. absolutely fine. And you're talking about the cinematography, we always say as to filmmakers who are maybe starting out or making their first, second, third project and they want to direct it, but they don't necessarily know the best way to get those shots. Working with an experienced DOP is like the number one advice that we always give because the, the vision that you may have, they know how to get. So you can then put your full trust into that and get the vision that you want. So just hearing you share the same or similar advice just means that people should take it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Easier said than done, of course, but yeah. Great. And what did you shoot on? <laughs> Digital. Digital <laughs> Doug's yeah. going to be so upset. <laughs> D Doug is going to be so upset that I did not have in front of me exactly what the camera was and what we shot on. Forgive me, Doug. Uh, but, um, yeah. Either way, it looks I, I, great. Yeah. Yeah. No, and he did the, 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 the nice thing was, is also a big part of our agreement was, uh, he did the color grading as well. So it was just like, whatever he was shooting, uh, he knew what he was wanting it to be. Yeah. And he was the one that was in charge of that. And so, you know, I just sat in the studio with him, just made some suggestions and tweaks. And, um, oh yeah, this... What, yeah, this part right here with the, um, yeah, this, this wound took forever to put on. 
and make as nasty as possible. Yeah, they yeah. take a long time, don't they? What was it? DiCaprio was in the makeup chair for eight hours before the mauling scene for the Revenant. Like, it takes Lovely. a long time to <laughs> get these things, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It's worth it, though, because something like bad prosthetics or bad makeup can just really take you out of a scene if it's done badly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sound is key as well, because oh, um, sure. back in that moment when I took the sleeve off of uh, the cut arm. Uh, in the studio, we found, <laughs> this is disgusting, but we found the sound effect of uh, hands in pig entrails. And so that's what's in the, that's what's very, very low volume when he's pulling back oh. the sleeve <laughs> of, uh, of, of the shirt is you can sure. hear that sound and it's extra nasty. <laughs> I do love how sound design plays such a great effect on everything. Mm -hmm. Some of the things people come up with is genius. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Foster, before we move on, what is next for you? What are you currently working on and, and how's your, or what's next? Uh, personally, just surviving quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but because of that, uh, I know earlier in the quarantine, uh, it allowed me to write a whole other script. It's, uh, as I said, the last one, the story that I'm working on uh, called Tiger's Eye, which is uh, uh, about a black teenage girl with uh, um, telepathic powers who senses a serial killer uh, in her town. And I wrote that first script years ago and left it on a cliffhanger and always had an idea of what I wanted the second one to be. And so I'd say sometime around April, I was just like, yeah, what the hell? And I just gave myself a schedule and sat down and knocked it out in about a month, the, the second one. Wow. Uh, but then I stupidly left that one on a cliffhanger. So hopefully <laughs> some point in time, I'll write the third one. Cool. Nice. Well, thank you so much for um, joining us. Do stick around My pleasure. for as long as you can and, and um, continue the conversations with the other filmmakers. Um, of but, course. Yeah. So we will move on to Team Drummies. We will. Yes. So I can see there's already a lot of support for you both in the chat room <laughs> saying hi and how awesome it is to have you on, on this today. So thank you both of you. So Thanks Leanne, for having us. Leanne and Tyron, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the film? Uh, sure. So um, Drummies is a film that follows a group of primary school age drum majorettes um, growing up in uh, the Cape Flats, um, in the townships of Cape Town. And it follows how they try to navigate living in, um, in an environment where drugs and gangs are rampant, but it's a coming of age story that talks about how the power of hope and community can um, help face an, um, immense adversity. So that's the doc essentially. Amazing. Uh, do you want to add anything, Taryn? Um, I think that pretty much covers it, but we wanted to um, do a coming of age stories that, that focuses on women throughout different age groups and how they can support each other, which is something that we immediately found um, in the group at uh, Dr. Vander. Amazing. Dr. Vander, yeah. So yeah. how did you find this? Like, why Cape Town? What, what was the connection? Um, so my parents are South African and my oh, mom okay. was a drummy in Durban. Oh, um, wow. So she actually suggested the idea um, and Lillian and I spoke about it and started just basically Googling schools. Um, and then Lillian just cold called <laughs> all these schools yeah. and she had an amazing connection <laughs> with Carol. Yeah, Carol yeah and I'm Momo. just calling people. There was one point, I think, when I finally got in touch with Carol she started speaking to me in Afrikaans and I had no idea what she was saying. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I mean, the rest is history. We, um, Momo and Carol, who are two of the coaches of the drum majorettes in, um, for Dr. Van der Ross, uh, primary school, they sort of became our aunties. Um, oh. We got really close with all the girls that we worked with um, in, in Cape Town and in Belhar and um, yeah, it, it, we really got to be a part of that community, and which how I think is, then? you can how see long? that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So how long were you out there for? About six weeks, I think. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So we were 
we hit the ground running. We landed and went straight to the school. Uh, mm -hmm. Carol picked us up from the airport and we went straight to Dr. Van der Ross. <laughs> and then the next day we were, we uh, were on, I don't know how long that bus was, but we were on there for like six hours or something with wow. the girls to go to Otsworen where we were there watching, um, you know, the girls practice day in and day out. We were up at five in the morning, in bed at two in the, in the evening. We had to stay up because the room that we in had, I think two outlets and we had to, we had our, our phones on timers to take turns charging all our batteries. Um, sure. But we didn't, we didn't sleep <laughs> at all. <laughs> and the girls don't sleep during this week. Like they, they are, I don't know where they get the energy um, there's actually a scene where they're just drinking loads of coffee. <laughs> That's probably where they get all their energy. But we had a great time. <laughs> what an amazing experience as well. And I think you can tell when sort of with different projects like this, if there has been a bit of a shortcut and mm. the filmmakers have just sort of inserted themselves into that situation for like one week, it shows because you definitely don't have that connection. And so you're not allowed the same access or trust with the subjects as you gain when you do participate fully. So yeah, it definitely pays off. So, yeah, I think, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, carry on. Oh, I was just going to say that um, in the film, uh, you know, you see the build up and the practice to the competition, but mm. um, logistically, we actually filmed the competition first. And, mm. um, you know, Tara can also speak more about this. But I think that was a huge part of gaining the trust of the girls and then also of the parents and the, fam the family members of the girls when we did the interviews later on um, because they saw that we really cared and, you know, we kind of fell in love with the girls that we were working with. Um, yeah. And, you know, we still have connections with these people. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Have you considered doing a follow-up or returning to see if there's anything else that you'd like to do with the same group or a fresh group of drummies. Taryn, do you want to take this one? I mean, yeah, I would absolutely love to. They're all such a great group of people. And I feel like there's so many stories to tell just at the school or within that community or even just with like Carol and Momo. Um, yeah, so I'd love to. Yeah, I think also the stories of the, uh, you know, these little drummies, you you can almost see the type of fixtures of, in the community they can become in the characters of Momo and the characters of Carol, uh, Carol um, Lynette. You know, these women are such incredible role models for these girls, and they face such incredible circumstances. And the strength of these women really are the the glue that hold these communities together. Um, and it's really beautiful to see. And I, I think it would be interesting to also maybe look at more in those, those women's lives and how they came to be where they are. I mean, you get glimpses of that throughout the film. Sure. How was, um, have, have all the drummy girls and everyone who took part in the documentary seen the film? They have seen it. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't get to watch it with them, which oh, we, no. we would have loved to do, but, um, a woman, uh, Bettina, that we were lucky enough to stay with did a screening for the girls and their families in the school. Um, nice. What was the reaction? Uh, I think they loved them. I, I got a, a photo of one of the little girls, Keisha, with her with her family. She had like a little one of the little posters and oh, yeah. um, but took some pictures as well. And, you know, we really wish we could be there, but. You know. Yeah. Of course. Oh, that's difficult. So, nice. so what's next for the film? It's, is it currently doing the film festival circuit or has it finished uh, the festival circuit? I, I think it's still doing the, We're still doing the film festival circuit at the moment. Okay. And then are you looking to get it distributed um, in any way that you can? Or I, will you be releasing it? on Vimeo or, or YouTube for the world to see? Or is there kind of a strategy behind what you would mm. like to achieve with this film? Um, I think we'd love to get it distributed. We're currently don't have it up on Vimeo as we're still applying to festivals, but sure. eventually that would be the goal. Yeah, I definitely yeah, I think feel like this is a film important. 
that needs to be seen by the wider audience. So my next question was going to be, where can everyone see it if they didn't manage to catch it during the New York Lifter Film Festival? Um, but I guess we'll just have to wait and hear from you to see where you're screening next and at which festival has accepted it. Um, I'm sure it will pick up quite a few. Um, I think it's a really interesting runtime. Um, it's roughly 48 minutes that you went for, which is perfect for TV because yeah, uh, cool. it allows for the adverts and everything else to go through. And I mean, Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and every other VOD platform don't really have that solid time frame anymore. It's so loose nowadays. Um, so I definitely feel like this is something that you could push towards a TV scene as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so is this no. a sort of style and genre that you both, you mentioned that you're definitely a partnership for future projects as well, I assume. So um, what do you sort of see as being next for you? Do you want to stick to a certain style or genre or is there something completely new on the horizon? Um, Lillian and I tend to have a, similar style, which I think is why we initially paired off together and um, worked really well together. Um, it's almost like a kind of like the A24 version of documentaries, so like a coming of age stories about girls in communities that normally aren't given the, um, they're, they're not seen on television, they're not seen in films, and there's no opportunity to really connect with them. So I think that's kind of both towards what, what we're aiming towards. Yeah, have you seen like yeah. the films by Kim Long and Otto? You know, this kind of gave me those vibes. You know, she's a wonderful filmmaker and who does the same thing, showing these stories and voices to mostly females who don't normally have that platform. No, I love that. It's great. Um, yeah, that's definitely um, uh, the aesthetic that we were going for. And as Taryn said, we 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 share that. that that's the reason why we paired up for this film is we, we share an aesthetic and... Um, when we spoke to each other, it was almost finish each other's sentences in this in the <laughs> sense when, you know, I had an idea for a scene, she's like, yes, and then this song, and it's like, it, it all worked together in this, it really, just really well, you know, um, and it's really hard to find that connection with someone. Yeah. Um, I mean, since Drummies, Tara and I have um, both gone in our sort of separate journeys, um, and, you know, Taryn's working in London, and I've been doing yeah. stuff abroad, um, in, in Brazil and in, in New York and you know who knows what's in the future for us but um, I definitely don't think this will be the last time we work together. No. That's really nice we do often say that if you find those strong creative connections hang on to them because it's definitely not easy to find but when you do like gosh does it open more scope for you that's great. Yeah, and it's just so nice to hear that you're both on the same page and you're finishing each other's sentences and it means that that creativity, nobody's like blocking it. It can just free flow and you, then you create amazing work. So I can see we've got Carol and Momo in the chat as well. That's yeah. really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Oh. Yes. They're just saying thank you and that they're so humbled. Um, so it's lovely. So you, you must have ended up with a lot of footage after all of the filming. So, I mean, it's crazy to <laughs> like the editing process. How did you find that? Um, we yeah. had so much footage. I think we so shot much. for 17 days. Did we have three terabytes of footage or something? Wow. I know, we had, a, we had a lot of footage. Um, a lot. When we got <laughs> yeah, when, when we got back to London, we kind of just disappeared for three weeks together to try to transcribe things and... Um, just try to take clips even from from different shoots to try to figure out a timeline but it was yeah it was difficult we had to edit it in two months i think yeah two months deadline. yeah it was our deadline just, just it was our, our deadline or it was it was our master's thesis so Tar oh, that's yeah. how Tara and i actually met so we met, sure. met in a master's program um and we were a bit we went a bit rogue and we're like we're going to go to africa <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, we managed to give, convince our, our course leader um, between Taryn's family connections. And I also have um, an uncle who lives in South Africa. And we kind of managed to pitch this thing like, we'll be safe, we promise. And then we just disappeared. <laughs> we don't need a fixer. We've got family members. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where did you do your MA? Um, at Imperial, Imperial College. Imperial, yeah, nice. 
Very cool. Mm. So then I guess what is next for both of you? If you're not working together on the next project, you mentioned that you were traveling around working in Brazil and other countries and, and you're in London. Are you, what, what is next for both of you? Um, for me, I've been, so I, last year around this time I was in Brazil shooting um, a short doc. It was a personal project on Afro-Brazilian identity. So, mm. um, my paternal grandmother is Afro-Brazilian and her family returned to Africa in a repatronage. So this was sort of a self-discovery. So exploring Afro-Brazilian identity and a, um, a concept called Sadaje, which doesn't have a translation in English, but essentially captures this feeling of nostalgia that Brazilians feel for their homeland and their ancestry. And so how does that manifest in the culture of Bahia, Brazil? So that kind of got put on the back burner with work, life happens, and now I have no excuse and I'm finishing editing that. And mm -hmm. I recently um, did a doc collaborating with Scanner. Um, it's an independent news outlet um, covering the Black Lives Matter protests in, in New York. So those are the most recent projects I've worked on. And you know, cool. I'm always writing down ideas, so we'll see. Amazing. And, um, and Taryn, what about you? I'm a development assistant producer at Newtopia, which is a production company in London. So we've been very busy during COVID um, coming up with new um, series ideas for like Netflix, HBO. Um, nice. We've just got a bunch of commissions that came through. So we're just working on those. And yeah, very cool. Well, we look forward to seeing more work coming from both of you. May I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it, Foster. I just wanted to go back to the master's thesis that you guys did. Um, did it change at all? In other words, you had two months to get it done for that deadline. Knowing, you know, like the academic world versus, you know, the festival entertainment world. Like when you finished it for the thesis, is that what was then sent out to festivals or after that, that's what I want. What, so what yeah. changed and how did you, how did you, yeah, how did you change it? And what, what, yeah. What was the difference that you found between getting it in for your thesis versus what you wanted to send out to the world? It got longer. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I think there were a lot of parts and pieces. I mean, I think one of the things that Tara and I came across was we had a, strong attachment i think you run this risk in docs is you we were living with these girls and we fell in love with these girls and with momo and carol and everyone that we interviewed and so we had emotional connections to things i mean there's shots that you know was up at 5 a.m to get or you know tara and i hadn't slept for 48 hours and we caught this shot and like so we had this attachment to a shot that wasn't serving the story so there was a in the editing suite there was a lot of um butting heads and lot, uh, there's some pain <laughs> saying goodbye to certain things um and and then also there were parts of the interviews that we really argued with our professor saying like this has to go in this has to go in and we kind of decided certain things were worth fighting for and other things we kind of let go and so the, th the thesis one was shorter yeah 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 we really struggled um because we went to editing, editing it, editing it straight after we shot it. And we had such a strong connection to everyone we shot with to, to cut some of the girls screen time to not feature them was just like, it was, we really struggled with it. Um, so we added a lot of the, yeah, we added a lot of that back in, how but long, not, I guess, how not long a, was it then for your thesis piece? 20 minutes. Yeah. Like it, it kind of doubled. Yeah. <laughs> so it really is essentially two completely different projects. Yeah, and we yeah. would have made it longer if you um, must have it much more of a narrative hour. arc running through this. Sorry? You must have a lot more of a narrative arc running through the 48 minute version rather than the 20. Although I think if okay. you if you have um a little bit of like festival money in a pod it would be very interesting if you submitted both <laughs> to see which one got selected more. If you mm. had, I, obviously festivals are expensive to submit to, so maybe if you had the money, but I think it'd be very interesting. A scientific experiment. What a great practice as well, though, to have done those two completely different cuts. 
Because, um, yeah, that must have been a very interesting experience, deciding what to put in in one for the mm. much shorter one, and then deciding which bits you really wanted going back in. So, no, that's so cool and a great question. So thank you, Foster. Okay. Are okay. there any final points or anything else that you would both like to add before we move on? Okay. No, I, I would so. say... If you're I would say if you're about to move on, as we talked before, uh, my day job is a college professor. I have a class that I need to get ready for that starts in 25 minutes. <laughs> I would love to find out and see. I'm going to watch the YouTube video. So uh, for the other two, I will watch all of that. But I'm going to go ahead and head on off. Thank you so much for this Thank opportunity. Thank you for joining us Foster, again. you might as well sit in the live chat room as you're doing your lecture and, yeah. and keep, <laughs> keep asking questions away. My, my will, Zoom students get you. enough uh, flack from me for when I see them on their phones uh, <laughs> while I'm teaching that I think it would be a bad idea for me to be doing that back to them. Sure. Well, thank <laughs> so, you so much. My pleasure. Thank oh, you, Foster. Yeah. And then there's a nice comment that's just come in here saying a very powerful film, um, immensely proud, and that's for you girls. Oh, thank you. No okay. Thank you. So then, Aaron, why don't you introduce your film and tell us a little bit about all of your roles within Mumbai, the daring Mumbaiker. Oh, oh, I think we just need to switch on to um, take your mute off first. Ta -da! Yeah, there you are. yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, see, I am the writer, actor, and director, but not the producer of this film. Okay. <laughs> now, well. <laughs> So producing is a major part. I mean, you need a lot of funds for that. Uh, that's almost next to impossible for a newcomer to get it. But though I've been very lucky that uh, I found a producer. He's from Sydney. He is my mentor. His name is Dr. Anjim Sheikh. And there's one more person who's Krishna Singh. These both people, they have helped me out to produce this full-fledged feature film. Actually, it's a commercial entertainer. It's more than one and a half hour. It's mm. got drama, it's got action, it's got so many ingredients. It's a full-fledged entertainer. So it's not an easy job to do that, you know, to uh, completely make a feature film with the standards. I mean, uh, it was very tough to maintain the standards. And with a tight budget, though the budget is high, it's not like a normal film. But I'm happy that I've gone through a lot and I've really completed it finally. And it's come up good. And there where I am here with your audience choice at all. Yes. As people are loving my film. Um, Amazing. Uh, so if you, if, yes. So you've said that this is different in length. There's a lot in it. What was the goal with this project? What, was, what were you hoping to achieve when you first conceived the project? I was hoping to achieve my dreams, my passion, because I'm born to write and act. Direction was not my part, but I had to do it. Okay. Because, uh, because I could not trust any other director. Uh, I mean, portraying my vision, you know? It was very tough to believe anyone who could do what I wanted. Though if after I have done so much, still I had a lot of problems with the cinematographer doing his shots, you know, giving his best. Still, you know, trusting him was very tough at times. Like, uh, see, if I plan a story, I need to take it the way I want it. But there are sometimes you have some creative ideas given by the cinematographer. And then when he shoots it, and you finally come up to the editing table, you see that it's totally different from the way you imagined it. And that's what happens with the direction part also. So I was, you know, my producer himself, actually I went to the producer just with the script. He wanted me to act in it. He wanted me to direct it. So finally I got that chance and I was happy about it. And then it was very tough. I mean, the whole journey was very tough because where you are, where you are the writer and then you are acting also and you're directing also. But I'm then very, Thankful to my associate director, Navraj Sharma. He's from Nepal and he's a very talented guy. He's been a great support throughout. Because when you're acting in the film which you're directing also, 
You need somebody there at the other end to, I mean, to check on you, to correct you. Definitely. But yes, yeah, so I had Navraz there always. So what I believe, this film is not directed by only me. It's the whole team work. Yeah. And I always believe it's not only the director who directs the film. It's a whole lot of people there, the crew, the assistants. There's so many people. Like we have around 110 people in our unit when we wow. are, uh, I mean, shooting wow, a film. Okay. So I would surely would love to give them the credits. It's my team. So that's how I say it. it's Team Derby. The Derby okay. Entertainment's Team Derby has directed this film. Nice. Love that. Yeah, that's a... That's a nice. And nice we have sport. quite a few of Team Derby in the chat room here, so they're saying much love as well. And um, do you keep having, do you keep sending us the questions because we will ask them to Iran and keep the conversation going. So we're at the wow. opening of the film. Why don't you guide us through some of your most funded, fondest memories or fondest memories? <laughs> the memories were that my cameraman, he mm. was uh, my cinematographer. He was so. I mean, he was so excited to work with me uh, that he he tried very different uh, experiments, you know. We had a trolley shot where he was shooting and this guy going round, round the trolley and he fell off with the camera. Oh, and nice. he literally, believe me, and I was more worried about the person, I mean, the cameraman, Mr. Hari Lama. I was worried about him that if he's hurt or no, though the camera was broken, it was a red door, an expensive camera. So oh, did you say they a red camera? Yes. So they broke off the viewfinder. Then we had a problem, oh, but I was more worried about Mr. Hari Lama that I uh, he, hope he's not hurt. Finally, we were very lucky. Nobody was hurt except just the camera. So that was a moment which I can never forget. They were so excited. I mean, you know, me and the actors, we were doing a scene, you know, and they were so excited about the whole thing. And they went off track. They went out of the way. They lost their mind. And they were going round and round and round for that particular shot. So that's one thing which I can never forget. I mean, it was a whole exciting journey out there for that particular scene. At this moment in time, we can see the fight scene. Um, how did you find that? How was the rehearsals for that? And, and what was it like shooting that on the day? Mm, it was great. Yeah, believe me, I'm actually a martial artist. Oh. I've done my Shotokan, yep. So the fight scenes which you are actually seeing, they are for real. I mean, we have not used any sort of cabling. It was very much real where I've hurt myself also. And those scenes were, and I feel I'm the most comfortable in fight scenes. Yes. I mean, where I have to do action, I'm very happy and I'm very excited. And I give my best shot and I feel it's very easy for me to do that. Nice. That's amazing. That's what I do you want to say your background? Uh, so my background's in um, acting and stage fighting. So my You've uni got course... a fellow fighter over here. Yes, my oh. uni course was essentially learning how to direct stage fights um, for film mm -hmm. and, yeah, for film as well. So just watching this has brought back loads of memories and it does look like you had a lot yeah. of fun. And as you've just mm. said, your confidence shines mm -hmm. through and the punches and the kicks all, all hit well. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's made me want to yes. pick up my arms and start fighting again. Just don't, yeah. <laughs> not, not me, <laughs> not you. Not you. Hope, 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 hope we could have a sparring sometimes. Oh, maybe. I come down to your country. Yes, okay. It's a deal. <laughs> it's live, so... Uh... Sure. <laughs> Anytime. Amazing. So, um, mm -hmm. the, when this film screened with us, uh, where we have our viewers leaving comments and feedback, same for the network round. Lots of people were very impressed with some of the themes that you touched on that are sometimes taboo in Bollywood. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what your plans were for that? Could you could you come again with the question? I cannot get you. Sorry. So so people said that you touched on taboo subjects for Indian mm -hmm. film for Bollywood. Um, was yes. that something that you were sort of nervous to do? Um, d tell us what it was like doing things that are not normally seen um, on screen still. Yep, see, let me come again. Like, to, uh, I am very comfortable with action, with the dialogues, with the performing part, but I'm very, very nervous with the intimate scene. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I am a shy guy there. But I had a very supportive co-artist, my actresses, both the main leads. 
uh, they were very supportive. And then I, I, I was pretty much uncomfortable doing all those scenes. I feel if I was to give uh, okay with that, I would say I'm not good at all. With the smooches, the intimate scenes and all, I'm very uncomfortable. And I still feel that could have been much more better if it was not me. And that's where I'm very uncomfortable. But with the action, the drama, and you see about the dialogues, you know, the attitude to be a hero, I have full confidence on that. Sure. And those were the scenes where the issues with me. Yeah, no, I just remember seeing lots of nice comments saying things like you often don't see LGBT in Bollywood films still or in Indian yeah. films. And um, it was something that people really liked seeing in your film. Yes, yes. We have, actually, I have written it so, so way that it's uh, touch that part of it. In India, we surely have a problem with that still. I mean, people are not that broad-minded here mm -hmm. still. I mean, they surely look down upon it. And then oh, I have uh, tried to, I mean, let people know that when they are struggling here, I think it should be in Hollywood also. It's not easy to get, become an actor. It's not easy to come here and get a, get your part of fame. You have to go through a lot of hardship. Mm -hmm. So I have written something which you could say, it's very hard to believe, but it, it did happen in one instant where I heard from someone that, uh, you know, you uh, even earlier in the past, there were actresses, they were, uh, I mean, they were compromising, but now it's totally different. Even the guys, the male actors, they have compromised in the past. I've heard from a lot of people. So I've tried to write something about it that there's a dark side of the industry. Mm. And, you know, people think very differently about it. So I've tried to touch that. Then I have even uh, showed something about the women empowerment, that if you're trying to misuse a woman, her revenge could be very, very deadly. Believe me, never underestimate a woman. She has all the powers, <laughs> believe me. If you see my film, I'm sure after watching my film, all the guys who are trying to mess around with the women, they will surely be scared of them. I mean, they, if you look upon the revenge what my actress, my second main lead actress has done to the guy who messed around with her, who messed her life up, she literally gave him tit for chat. So it has a whole different message there that never underestimate women. And for the LGBT community also. I mean, there is a craze for uh, homosexuality. There is, it is there, but it's all under the blanket here yeah. in India. I mean, you know, it's not that open. So I've tried to show that how people look upon it, how you're targeted with that, and how like people are using it, you so know? Having these themes then within your film, have you found that as a hindrance to getting into film festivals in India? Oh, that's a good question. Mm, yes, actually, I didn't even try much there. You okay. Know, okay. I didn't even try much there. I have not sent to one single Indian festival, not yet, for that reason. For that reason. So where have you found that, that the film has had most success? It's... I mean, through the festival, it's not yet released, so I can't say, like, how is it going to happen? So it's, it's with it's the festival right thing the with you guys, sorry? So you're right at the beginning of your film festival experience with this film? Yes, exactly. But overall, I'm a total virgin with everything. With this interview, this is the first interview of my life, I guess. Somebody's taking my interview. Well, it's and, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I will never forget you guys. And yeah. then... I have, uh, uh, my film was a runner-up in Los Angeles. I went to the runner-up round. And then I missed on a lot of places, you know. I had my assistant, he sent the film uh, with the trailer. We did not send the whole film. There was a mistake which we made, I mean, uh, recently. So I didn't stand much chance out there. But what I believe that my, I make films to entertain people. And I surely have a little message there. That's what wins me over. I mean, my audience, they should be happy about what they're seeing. That's more important to me as a writer. Yeah, and, and your fans here in the chat room proved that. Um, I've got a question here from UAE Services saying, Hi, Iran. Was it tough, tough writing, directing, and acting at the same time? We've kind of touched upon this, but if you wanted to give a quick answer, mm -hmm. that'd be nice. Y yes, I, it wasn't tough for me because the, I'm the writer. 
and uh, portraying what I've written was very easy for me. And but surely for directing part, where I could not see myself while performing, so I had my associate there to support me. So it was not very tough. Acting was not at all tough. <laughs> so do we take from that answer then that that's the way you sort of want to go forwards to sort of wrap things up what's next for you do you want to pursue acting more than directing yeah i would uh, love to do writing and acting more yeah. then comes the direction part where i have written something i would like to direct it it's not an issue but i would I don't mind uh, working with someone else who's directing. In fact, I'll be more happy that's less of a burden. Well, I'm sure that this film will act as a great business card to get you in front of the right people for Definitely. for more auditions and yeah, and your writing as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. thank you so much that's for joining us. That's my showreel. Yes. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us. I really do hope that it does well on the festival circuit all over the world. Do stay um, on touch or on touch. Do stay on screen as we lead on to Jane and what is love of the final film of today's roundtable. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jane. As we get your film up, why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? And if you have the synopsis, that would be great to share. OK, um, yeah, what is love? It's actually a, a docu-series, um, even though the first episode stands as a standalone short for the festivals. Um, so it's about love. It's about a word we all use and yet, you know, rarely try to define. Um, we interviewed over 150 people. Wow. Yeah. Alec Baldwin, Mercedes Rule, Linda LaPant, uh, Rodney Yee, um, people from all there walks is. of there is. <laughs> um, all walks of life, ages, uh, sexualities, color, um, cultures, and. Um, just getting their innermost thoughts on, on love and relationship, um, the mystery of love. So, um, it, yeah. It's, it's great. It's such an endearing topic and such a simple but effective concept. Um, what what brought you the idea to just ask this one question, but, but tricky question, to so many people? Like, where did the idea come from? Um, well, actually, one too many heartbreaks. Uh. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to sit my friends down in front of a camera. Um, and I worked with a cinematographer before, and we had a very simple setup. I'm, I work in a lot of different visual mediums, so mm. um, I'm an artist, photographer, filmmaker. Um, and we worked in my art studio, which was very small. We had a two cameras set up. Um, one was on a slider and he operated both cameras and did the audio. <laughs> so it was a very intimate setup, um, I think, which really helped um, bring people out of themselves. And so, um, yeah, I started asking my friends and then I realized I, I worked very organically and I realized I was onto something. Um, and so I just kept interviewing people and about six months into um, shooting, I went on a solo trip to Australia and I met Alex Mankiewicz, who's the daughter of four-time Oscar winner, Joseph Mankiewicz. Nice. And so she came on the project and um, you know, did, also did some of the interviews. And then together we did a rough cut of the seven episodes. So each episode has two questions about love and relationship. Um, and we finished the, uh, the first one. She's back in Australia, so I'm basically working on this primarily by myself, although we're still in a lot of contact. And um, yeah, the idea is to get it to a streaming platform because there are seven episodes. And so, uh, as you've already said, it's a very intimate topic. Um, with a lot of, well, obviously, emotion behind that. What tactics did you use to get people to feel like they could really open up with you? Uh, I think I was just myself, you know, um, and although a lot of them were friends or acquaintances, um, 
sometimes I just grab people off the street, basically. <laughs> um, a bit like Humans of New York style. I mean, this definitely kind of, you know, reminds me of a video version of that. Do you follow the artist, um, the journalist Humans of New York? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you well. Do you, do you know the journalist Humans of New York, the photography project? No, I don't. It sort of reminds me of that when you said grabs people of the street. That's how his project first started, was doing the uh. census of New York. And he would literally photograph and interview different people. And it's now a worldwide project with millions of followers on social media. But um, no, so I love the idea that you also just sort of <laughs> yanking people and asking them life's big questions. Yeah, and one of the the challenges of the project, actually, because I live in a relatively small community, was keeping it a secret for over two years. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I actually, when they signed the release form, I had them sign something that said they would not divulge the topic because no one knew the question in advance. So they were coming in, sitting down, having no idea what they were going to speak about, and they're Although, you know, there's Alec Baldwin, there are there are actors in there. Most people had no experience sitting in front of a camera um, and being and interviewed you, it was the first time. That's how you get the amazing opening montage of people's reactions when they hear the question, <laughs> yeah. um, which is a great opening. Yeah. And then, you know, I just decided on this very classic, simple gray background because, first of all, for for financial reasons, um, just not having to, to move around all the time. But I think it really created, um, the, the, the faces became landscapes in a way. Um, yeah. You know, emotional landscapes just by the simplicity of it. And then the actual love graffiti was shot in many different countries around the world. Um, I don't know if there's anything coming up right now. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of love graffiti from all over the world to create, yeah, a little bit of breaking up the, the talking heads. Yeah, no, you're 100% correct by using the simplicity of the gray background. Everyone really does pop and you can, it's almost like you can see into their souls a little yeah. bit. Um, <laughs> so I think it was a, a really nice choice. Um, yeah. What was interesting is that um, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but actually uh, it seems that love is very personal. Mm, and uh, everyone does have different experiences. Yeah, um, for every single question in every episode, um, people had, you know, diametrically opposed answers. So, you know, yeah. the, it's a very personal experience. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. So the, the other six episodes are in a, a rough cut stage, right? And, um, I'm hoping that this first episode will propel things to a streaming platform. But of course, the festivals are all virtual, so there's no going and, and meeting with people and, yeah. and the contacts that are necessary to, to move it to that stage. So mm -hmm. what are you doing? Do you have a method of, for how you're reaching out to people during these bizarre times then? Um, well, I, I'm going to let it run the festival circuit a bit. And then, yep. you know, Vimeo uh, is obviously an option. And um, yeah, just uh, making those contacts by via email um, or other methods to get through to the streaming platforms. I know, you know, there's aggregates, uh, sales agents, different different approaches. I think because Jane, uh, I had a question for Jane um, yeah. because I, uh, in college, once tr attempted to do something similar on an iPhone, asking random people about love. So oh, cool. uh, it made me smile. It made me smile to um, read the synopsis. Um, and one thing I found interesting that some people couldn't articulate what love was to them in words. And so some people dance, some people, you know, express themselves differently. And I was, I'm, I'm curious to know if anyone found the same difficulty with language as a means to express the definition of love that people feel the need to sing or move their bodies or I don't know, play an instrument. Um, what's the most interesting way someone answered your question? I did actually have some people dance and some people um, sing. 
um, but it actually didn't end up in the final cut. Um, it sort of felt out of place in relationship to everything else. But most people found something to say, you know, eventually. Um, and I just gave them time. I just sat. I said, look, take your time. And, uh, so um, there's a question here from Chris Richardson who says, Jane, what is your definition of love? <laughs> <laughs> Putting you in the hot seat now. <laughs> six years later, I've been, <laughs> I've been working on this for six years. Um, you know, I, that's, that's a big challenge for me. I, I don't want to... I don't want to define it, but um, as I said, when I had the world premiere, I had a live premiere, which was really nice before yeah. COVID. And um, I say that I say I love you a lot more to people in my life, and um, nice. That um, that's become that's I yeah. liked Lillian's question. What was the most interesting response out of all those people? You said it was a lot of interviews. What do you think was the most interesting response? Um, there's a friend who spoke about absolute and relative love, and mm. you know, referring on relative love as you know the interpersonal between people, and then absolute love as being more of a, a force, a divine uh, force that that unites us all. I mean, I think today in this world we're living in today i mean yeah love is is what's going to bring us together for sure yeah so do you see yourself as a documentary filmmaker is this the way you want to continue going forwards well my first documentary was extremely visual with no talking heads okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I just swung in an opposite direction here because it was very personal for me in the beginning. Um, it, it, um, you know, it was something I needed to, to explore for myself. Mm. And then now it's taken on sort of kind of a mission, you know, in the world to, to get this out there and have really, the aim is to create a dialogue, not to define love but to create a dialogue, to open a conversation. I know many people who took place, uh, took part in the film, said they went home and discussed it for hours, or, yeah. or people who have seen it, um, you know, they were, they laughed, they cried, they went home to their partners and had long discussions about it. So yeah, it's, the aim was to create a, a, a conversation um, about, about love, and so, through the various episodes, we get to um, a more universal approach. Um, mm. Absolute love, yeah. And do you have um, social media that runs alongside this, for example, an Instagram page or um, a Facebook page? I have a Facebook page, um, which I've been a little bit derelict. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> The only, um, the only reason I'm asking work is because on it this if you're week. releasing um, these. I, I, have it on, I have it on Instagram. I mean, I have a personal Instagram, and there's I've you know obviously posted some things about it. but Because um, I, I feel like if you've got seven or two questions per seven episodes, then it'd yes. be really nice to have like a, a short clip on your social media, whether that be as a story or as a post, which will then entice people in to watch uh, the full episodes because then you're already giving away what that question might be. So then they've right. already started to think about it and they find themselves involved in your piece, whether they've only seen that little snippet or the full full episode. Mm. And right. that means that your question is being thought about way wider than you thought originally. It's just an yeah. idea, but it, it could yeah, be Yeah, no, worth it. I mean, I have thought of taking, you know, clips and, and then creating an Instagram page. Um, just trying to keep up with everything. Yeah. I, think, yeah, you know, I, do it, I do it all on my own, you know. So yeah, of course, of course. everything, every single step is, you know, and um, a lot of support from, you know, we did a successful Kickstarter campaign and a lot of support from the community, which has been helpful. And um, But yeah, I'm sort of director, producer, editor, <laughs> co-editor. What is your favorite part? Um, I love it all. I mean, that's why I love filmmaking. Yeah. Sure. 
because there's so many, there's periods of filmmaking where you're working alone then you're working in collaboration with other people and it's it's all rich and it all brings you something and all the different stages um yeah i find that so fascinating to be able to work in in so many different ways on one project you know, so mm. with so with you other mentioned, uh, your first documentary was very visual the second documentary is floating heads what's the third one going to be <laughs> um well hopefully i'll be working on this for a couple more years to finish up the other episodes yeah. um i'd like to work more experimentally actually sort of um, in the vein of laurie anderson um, mm. who's actually lives down the street and has agreed to be in the film but uh, <laughs> now with covid I haven't gotten sure. to no. that um, amazing yeah that's that's how i'm thinking at the moment well, I wish you all. And then there's always, um, just to finish, there's always other questions that can be asked. There's many. <laughs> oh my, there's so many. <laughs> what is life? Yeah. No, let's oh, not go down there. I mean, that's even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can send me your send me your questions, and I'll get right on. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for providing this platform and and having me no, on. Thank you so much. I mean, we know that so many people enjoyed all of your projects. Um, so it's just been a pleasure to be able to have all five of you on discussing them further for, for people to learn about because we always say it's the best way to learn yourself is yeah. to listen to other people's experiences, engage with their work. Um, so no, it's been such a pleasure to screen all of your all of your films. Well, I have just 10 seconds if I could get. Of course, yeah, go, of go for it. <laughs> I would like to thank my action director, Chandra Pant, and my fashion designer, Tan. Uh, she was so supportive. I mean, she's always been there. She's my backbone. So I'm sentimentally thanking them. I'm really obliged to have them in my life, especially Tan. Right. Thank you. Yes. No, thank you. And thank you to Jane and Lillian and your teams as well. Um, I look forward to following your journeys and seeing where you go. Yeah, we thank will, you so we much lift off. You. Lift off. We'll be watching you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so stay in touch with us, do please. Okay. Thank you again, yes, sure. and thank you so much. We will see you soon, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. Thank okay. you for having thank us. Thank you guys for having us. Here. <laughs> thank Thanks you. a lot. Bye. 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 Cool. That was oh, great. Yeah, that was four absolutely wonderful and different films. Very different, mm. um, yeah, all amazing. And as I said, we had so many amazing comments from those, lots of people enjoying all of them. And the chat room's been buzzing with everyone sharing their love, which I think is appropriate considering- Very appropriate. Considering the last film there. Cool. Um, well, on Friday, we will be announcing the winners of the Toronto Lift Off Film Festival, along with then the first round of the Los Angeles Lift Off voting round to see which films are currently in pole position. So do join us on Friday for that. And, so we'll um, find out which Toronto films will be doing this with us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That will be great. Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, well, then, I do, all I have to say is goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Rupert, but he's, he's like asleep and... Hey, baby. There he and is. And goodbye from Rupert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us.